of CDS, less than 28 grams, methamphetamine. Possession with intent to distribute CDS, less than 28 grams, methamphetamine. And distribution of CDS, less than 2 grams, methamphetamine. Sentencing dates are July 23rd and 29th of 2019. Sentence to a total of 10 years. Parole date, July 16, 2021. Good time, July 14, 2022. Full term, January 15, 2029. Is this information correct, sir? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Mr. Kelsey. Hi, Mr. LeBlanc. Um, how old are you? I'm 46. How long have you been down on this 10-year sentence? Three years. And uh, when's your last discipline? Uh, I've never had one. Okay. Tell me, uh, are you currently in some type of uh, a good time class right now? No, I've, I've tried to get in them, but uh, no, I'm not. Um, from what I understand, I'm not a high risk. So the high risk uh, inmates get them first. Uh, I do have a, a, a substance abuse class I took for non good time. You know, I just to have it under my belt, you know. I, 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 and I've I, seen some, I, you've taken I, some class, uh, you've taken some classes on your, on your other stints in prison as well. Right. Yes. Sir. Yeah. I mean, I, I was looking back in 2015, you took a whole lot there. And, yeah. um, let's see. And when the last time you took good time was when? Was when you first got in? Uh, 2015. I mean, I mean some, I, some I in 17, right? Uh, no, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, you're right. 2015. I, I, did, uh, I did Lafouche Parish drug court back in uh, 2003 to 2006. I, I graduated drug court program. So you've done nothing in 2021? Uh, it's just a, uh, a substance abuse. Like anger management or personal development? Or... No, just uh, right here, substance abuse impact class. But it wasn't uh -huh. done. I have when was that done? This was uh, May of 2020. Uh, and so you're you're not able to. There's no classes there that you can get in from. Uh, again, if, first of all, listen. Are you a drug dealer, or a drug user, or both? Uh, well, I mean, I sold drugs to make the drugs free, sir. You know, I I lost my job and I. I to do drugs, I, I sold the drugs to make the drugs. I didn't so you're a drug more. dealer to support your habit, is what you're saying. Yeah, yes, sir. Pretty much, yeah. And it looks like you I mean, according to what I'm reading, you've been involved in it for a long time. I mean, you 46 year old man. What, what what's gonna make me feel good that you got it figured out here? You don't really have any treatment. You got that, that little certificate that's well. Have you had any long term treatment? Have you gone anywhere? Have you done? Uh, Yes. Uh, well, if you if you look at my record, I went from 2002 to 2014 without getting any trouble. I stayed clean for 11 years in that period, from 2003 to 2014. I, I was drug free. I was, you know, this is my first relapse in 11 years. You know, I completed I completed Lafouche Parish Drug Court, and I stayed clean for 11 years. I became a supervisor for Chevron uh, in the all field. You know, I had a good life. I raised my kids. I coached my kids in sports. You know, I had a good life when the all field fell out in 2014 and I lost my job. Just like another 100,000 people, I, I fell off. I started using, you know, but I stayed clean for 11 years. I know how to do it. I worked with a sponsor. I actually sponsored guys in the program, you know, in AA and NA. I sponsored people. I've been to a halfway house and treatment back in 2003. And I, from 2003 to 2014, I was drug free. And that's good. And that's that's good for you. I mean, that, that is good. But it's concerning that you, you, you know how to stay clean and you still couldn't do. It. So I, I guess what I'm saying is, is that so and I guess you have a good time coming up. I see you'll be out shortly. Uh, yeah. But But, you know. You know, that's concerning. I mean, you, you know how to stay clean, but but what's going to keep you? Listen, a lot of stress out there. What you think you're going to get back out there and get a big job? It's probably going to be difficult. No, I have a good job. Well, I'll have, you'll have my paperwork. I'm an engineer for a company called GOL, Gulf Offshore Logistics. 
I'm an unlicensed engineer for a seven million dollar boat right now. You know, so, so, it was lined up. Yes, y'all. Is that the it? job you had before? Uh, I've worked for this company. Yes, I, I know the owner of the company. They got me working as a. I'm sorry, they had me working as an unlicensed engineer. I was a supervisor and a crane operator for uh, in the oil field for ten years. You know. Well, I have three good job offers right now, but the job that I sent the paperwork in the yard is called Gulf Offshore Logistics. I work unlicensed engineer on a 200 foot supply vessel. They're going to let me work whatever schedule yeah. I want. You yeah, know, sure. my problem in 2014, sir, was when the oil field fell out and the price of oil dropped, over 100,000 people in South Louisiana lost their jobs, and I was one of them. You right, know? right. Listen, I, I, listen I, I get my dad all his life. Worked in the oil field, right. so I understand it's difficult. It's a difficult, and I don't. And I know a lot of people lost their jobs, and I know that what you're telling me. But I mean, we're here for you, right? You know, I I, I get it. It's like a smart guy. You're probably a hustler going to work, but but what what what's going to make you? What's going to make you not go back? You you're involved in crystal meth. You involved. You know, you, you make it. I mean, you're selling it. You're using it. You. I mean. What, what, what's going to what you what's what's going to be different? I can tell you what's going to be different. Yeah. You know, okay. In the eleven years I stayed clean because of drug court. The first when I was in drug court, we had to make three meetings a week. Okay. When I graduated drug court, it dropped to you know one or two meetings a week. After about five years, when I was about five years sold, I quit going to meetings. Five to six years, I quit going to meetings. I would. I quit talking to people in recovery because I thought, well, I had it. I did it on my own. I didn't use. So I went another five years without using, without going to meetings, without talking to my sponsor who lived in Lafayette. I did all of that. You know, and I, I walked away from it. I figured I had it, you know. But then as soon as I lost my job, you know, look, I made $100,000 my last year in the oil field. I had a house, a truck, a car note. I had my kids in private school, which cost me a fortune. So when I lost my job and I went from making hundred thousand dollars a year to making nothing, it was too much for me. And I didn't have the structure of going to meetings and working with my sponsor and all that, you know, and that's, that's what happened. That's, that's how I fell, you know? So are I you married? Talk. Yes, I was married. Yeah. Are you married now? Yes. Same wife? Uh, yes. From 2000. Yes. My second, it's my second, I have three kids with my first wife. And I have one daughter with my second wife. But my first daughter is a freshman in college. She needs my help right now. My first wife and my kids were in a house in, the, in Hurricane Ida that the roof came off. My son was almost killed. My first wife and my kids are living in a camper right now. My first wife lost her house and her job. They live in a camper. She's about to lose her vehicle. My, my family needs me out there. I'm a, I'm a hard worker, you know? I'm sorry. How old are your kids? How old are your first kids? What's your first wife? 19. My son's gonna make 16 next week, and I got a 14 year old with my first wife. And how old is your daughter with your second wife? Uh, she'll be eight next month. Okay, and they all That's struggling a, right now. They, they I, all I look, I feel you, I feel your pain. I, I do, and you're right, you're exactly right. You need to be out taking care of. That's a fact. That's a fact. But look, I, and, and I want to try to help you get out there. I just you know, want to make sure you have a because look, I'm gonna put some strict uh, uh, stipulations on you if I vote to let you go because you're right, you need to be involved in NAA. You, you know, you're in a very structured environment, you're staying good now. Sounded like when you were in a very structured drug court, you were good, but it's not gonna be like that. I mean, there's gonna come a time when you know, you, you're not, it, it, you know, again, it's, it's what do you know. To, to stay clean and sober because you sounds like you got it figured out right when you're using drugs things are bad if not you got a good job you're working i mean you got four kids man for god's sake you're right you need to be taking care of those kids but but those kids were there before right when you got in all this trouble i mean they were still there when, when right. you decided to do the meth route right well you know i, I mean my first this is uh my rationalization which was wrong was when I lost my job and I couldn't find another job, I, honestly, I was like, well, I know I can make money selling drugs to keep my house and keep my truck and keep my car. And that first, that's what was my, you know, that's what it was. I need to make money to pay my house note. I let my truck go. I let my wife's car go. My kids are still in private school. 
I had a house note. I was trying to sell drugs to pay the bills. And I went three weeks selling drugs before I started doing it. And I figured, well, I can still do it. And I mean, it was, it was, it was irrational. It was, it was stupid of me. But I can see now, it was, you know, what I did, you know, my parents tell me, my, my, I have a great family. I, I cannot blame any of this on my family. I'm not a product of my, my environment. Sure. I got a great family. Sure. And they, you know, they behind me right now. You know, my mom and my dad both said that they, they know that if I wouldn't have lost my job, if I wouldn't have got laid off, I wouldn't be here right now. You know, right. but I can't make, I can't use that as an excuse. I mean, I know they're right. If I wouldn't have lost my job, I, I, I know I wouldn't be here right now. Right. So, so, right. So what happens if you get out and you got this great job and you lose it again? I, I mean, you, you, are you going to go right back to selling drugs? Cause you just said, that's what you decide. I can make a living selling drugs. I mean, right. But like I told my dad the other day, what I'm not doing is I'm not going to finance a house. I'm going to buy it. The job I got, I can work straight time. As long as the parole officer lets me stay offshore, I can stay offshore. My dad's looking for me a lot to buy cash, a trailer to buy cash, a truck to buy cash. The oil field is too unpredictable right now. With presidents wanting to go green, the price of oil going from $100 a barrel to $23 a barrel up and down. I'm not doing like I did. You know, the oil field treated me good from 1993 to 2014. I was on a drilling rig a week after I graduated high school. I could have went to college. I had a, you know, I could have cut out a scholarship, but I went straight to a drilling rig. You know, so from 1993 to 2014, the oil field treated me really good. But right now, with everything, the presidents and OPEC and everything like this, the oil field is not reliable. So I need to buy listen, a lot listen, of cash. I listen. need to have everything paid off. Because right. Listen, I appreciate I appreciate that. I appreciate it. I'm telling you, the oil field has not been predicted for a long. My father, that's how I was raised. My dad was worked his way up from a roustabout to a roughneck to a driller. I mean, I, I know. I know the old business. Back in the 80s, there was a huge boom and bust. And look, we had to move. I, I get it. I get what you're saying. And, and, and I understand that. But, you know, I, I just, listen, I, I got to you know, feel comfortable that you, and look, sounds great. I'd like to have everything paid in cash and not have any bills. That's not reality. Okay. That's just no, not real. My, that, my wife found that, a lot for $5,000. I, I get it. Just, I'm just telling you, I'm not saying that you're not going to do it. I'm saying reality in this world to have everything paid. It's rare. I don't know many of them that, that, that they got everything paid for. We all got bills. We all got notes. We all got stuff. Okay? So, so, you know, I just, you know, again, I hear you and I feel for you and, and I want to feel good that you're going to be able to you know, manage it and handle it. It's going to be a lot of stress and pressure, but you know, I, I just, um, you know, I, I want to be comfortable that you're going to you know, go back out there and, 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 you know, not fall back in that same spot. I'll be glad, I'll be glad to have mandatory uh, to have to go to so many meetings. I'll, oh, I'll be glad to do that. Right. All that will happen. That's right. Now, if you're offshore for, are you doing 30 days off, 30 days on? You're doing two weeks off, two weeks on? What are you doing? I was going to work as much time as I can. And the, 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 the schedule is 28 and 14. Yeah, so you'd be on for 14 days, and so you, you, you're going to have to go to something. I mean, I'm not going to just, you know, we'll just wait till you get to have data. I mean, I, you're going to have to go to something. Oh, I have no, I mean, I plan on doing, you know, like when you finish treatment, they tell you to do 90 meetings in 90 days. So I plan on making a meeting every one of my days off. You know, and look, you can do Zoom meetings now. I mean, you have access to do Zoom meetings now, right? right. I, mean, you can, you, I mean, you can do them. Yeah. So, anyway, like, listen. A great sponsor and i know i can uh, call him sounds like you got it you just got to stick with it but look let me let me ask i let, got a few other people ask some questions let me, miss cheryl we'll let I just you have, yeah i just have one mr leblanc i see you were in work release and from january of 20 to april of 2021 is yes. that right yes. why were you why are you no longer in work release because they didn't want to let me take any good time classes so did you so quit? I left, and I, and I, I left voluntarily. The sheriff pulled me out, and I still haven't got any good time classes because I was working. Okay, that's that's all. That's the only question I had. I appreciate. <laughs> I, it. I, left, I left voluntarily to get that's classes. That's it, Mr. Kelsey. All right, Miss uh, Jackson. You're on Sorry. mute. Good morning. Go ahead. I'm gonna tell you something. You talk too much. 
Sorry. You talk way too much. And the more you talk, the more you display that you don't get it and you're not ready. You get out uh, in July um, of this year. I, yeah, July 14th of, of this year. I think you got some more work to do. And I think you need to stay there and do that work. Uh, you're, you're trying to convince yourself. You're not convincing me. You're doing a lot of talking, but it's not really sounding like you really have a grip on your situation. Um, that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Kelsey. All right. Um, and, and, and again, listen, there's a lot of truth to that. We, you, you know, we see this all the time. You want to talk to get out. And, and the problem that I have, let me just be honest with you. The issue that I have is that I don't know if you're going to get anything where you're all. Doesn't sound like it, you know. So, so, and you're going to be out in a minute. So, so, do I put these specific stipulations on you and force you to do it and, and, and allow you to get out, or do I leave you there and hope that you get some type of substance abuse in the next six months? I mean, look, I, 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 don't, I don't even know, you know, if we have enough time uh, to get you somewhere. I, I just don't know. Um, would you like to make a statement on your behalf? Yeah, yes, I would. Go ahead. Uh, you know, I am. I'm 46 years old. You know, I, I do know how to stay clean. I do know how to stay sober. Um, my family needs me out there. My daughter's a freshman this year at UL Lafayette, and she might have to drop out her first year of college because I'm not there to help her financially. And my wife in the storm lost everything, and she can't help her. So my daughter's about to have to drop out of college her first year. She got a scholarship, but it doesn't cover everything. So my daughter's about to have to, have to drop out of college her first year in school because her dad's not there to help her. You know? I know how to stay clean. I know how to stay sober. I've done it for 11 years. I did it for 11 years. I had this relapse and it's been like a downward spiral for me. You know, I was in Raymond Labor in Cottonport. And all of a sudden I looked up and I said, how did I get here? You know, I went from a great job, a great life, coaching my kids in basketball and softball and volleyball my daughter's a cheerleader. I went from all of that to sitting in a prison in, in Cottonport. So how did I get here? So I had to do a little inventory of myself and figure out how I got here, what I didn't like about myself that I needed to change. And since two years now, I've been working on that. I've been reading everything I can. I learned trigonometry myself. I got a book at the library in physics, and I tutored people. And you know, they get their GED and I, I went to Cottonport and I went to my first AANA meeting and they started the knowledge I had of it. So I chaired meetings over there once a week. You know, I'm doing everything I can. They're not letting me take classes. Believe me, it's not a lack of trying. I'm trying. I got one certificate for a substance abuse class that I took with no good time. I took it just because it's stuff I knew, it's stuff I learned already, but I took it just to have that fresh under my belt for when I get out there, just a little knowledge, just a little structure, a little bit of structure I can get. Now, they're not letting me take classes over here, you know? So I'm going to get out in July. From right now to July, what am I going to learn that I don't know now? I'm sorry. I, I, there's nothing I'm going to learn from here to July that I don't know now. What I'm going to do is my wife's going to lose her car. My daughter's not going to be in college in that six months that I'm going to stay here. And I'm going to this, learn nothing. Right. Sorry. You know, I, I know. This. but I do know how to stay sober. Now, if you want to, I know they got TADAC where I live, where you got meetings. They got Zoom A meetings. Sure. Zoom, whatever. What I will go any length right now to be able to be out there with my family and take care of my family. Like, I, I got it. I understand you were out there. Just remember, just remember you were out there when you chose to, to do the drug. I mean, you know, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I, I get it. Listen, I get it. And I feel for you. We, you know, we hear, you know, uh, I, you know, it's, it's really about you. It doesn't, you know, I don't want to see your daughter have issues or your kids have issues, but look, it's about you. If you can't get you right. They're going to have problems from here on out. 
from here on out, you've been in jail. You are, let's see, you are a fifth class offender, right? Is that what you are? Let me go back and just let me clarify that because mm -hmm. I want to, you know, make sure we're on the same page here. Fifth class offender, right? Not a first class, didn't do it the second time, you know. I told you know, it, it's over a 22 year span. No, no, but it is what it is, but it's you. But, I, it, but it's you. Know, if I can't help myself, I can't help my family. And that's I know a that. fact. I that's a fact. I know, but I but but help myself. I know, right, that. right. I, listen, listen, you, you like Miss Jackson, you talk too much, but you were there in an orange suit talking to me. So you you, you you ain't figured it out yet, right? It's, I mean, I get it. You you sound like you got to figure it out. You say you got to figure it out, but you there talking to you you talking to me. You in jail? Yeah, you right, talking yeah. to me in jail? Yeah, I I and you know what? I know I got to figure it out. I know how to do this. I know you know. And I'm sorry, Mister Nazi. Can, can, excuse me, just a second. Is there any 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 way? Can he he can't even get moved and get any type of treatment in any quick time frame can we can we do something no they're not moving right now because of the covid but i do know they have he's in look he's in uh plaquemines they do have programs are you at where are you right now i'm in tinsaw tinsaw yeah tinsaw so they don't have anything in tinsaw no i've been trying yo <laughs> i mean and that's the thing they're not gonna move so 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 listen what about what about work release so i can help my family my company that I work for, GOL, hires out of West Feliciana work release. The warden over here was trying to transfer me there a few months ago, but he couldn't. And, yeah, it doesn't sound like they do a lot of transferring because of COVID. It's really what's going on. So here's the thing. Let's just stop talking. Just stop talking. I'm only one vote, but this is what I'm voting. Look, this is probably against my better judgment, but I, I, I there's a couple of things. You, you, look, I want to give you as many stipulations as I can. You're getting out in J July. You ain't going to be, you're right. You're going to get out in July and they're going to do nothing. I'm only one vote. Hey, I'm going to, believe it or not, I'm going to vote to grant you. The only reason I'm going to vote to grant you is because I can, I'm, I'm going to give you 90 meetings in 90 days. I'm going to require you to go three times a week to NAA after that, whether it be Zoom, Zoom whether you're on the, the boat or not. You're going to have random drug tests. You're going to have, um, you know, you have to maintain full time employment. Um, and I want you to take a class called Thinking for a Change. It's on the street. They can give it to you. You need to take it, whatever it requires. OK, listen, and and I'm doing that because I don't because you're right. You got kids you need to take care. Of. It's proven that you can work. You, you, you got work. But look, this is your last shot. If, you, if you're done now, you, you'll be in jail for the rest of your life. Now, look, I'm just, it doesn't mean you're going to get out. You, you're gonna get out in, in, in July, but I, I don't I I don't know what to do with you, what's better, what's not. I can't if, if I can send you to a long-term rehab, that's where I'd send you to. That's where you need to go. Believe it or not, you need to go to a long-term rehab and figure it out. But this is the best that I can do uh, without you know you know keeping you sitting in jail for six months and probably not getting any classes. You're right. A lot of things you said right, but look, you need to look sometimes just man, just just don't talk. Sometimes just better. We get it. We all love our kids. I know you love your kids, but, but you know, you here for a reason. You in front of me for a reason because you ain't figured it out yet. So, so that's my, and you're going to have a curfew when you're off the boat from nine to six. You're not going to be running the road. You're going to be home from nine to six unless you're at church or you, you, you know, you, there, there's something going on. You can parole officer and discuss that. That's my vote. Don't mean you're gonna get out. You're gonna get out in July. Just one vote. That's all I got for you. It's the best I can do for you. I mean, I wish you the best of luck, but, but you gotta figure it out. So that take take think of a change, 90 meetings in 90 days, three times a week meetings, random drug screens, curfew when you're at home from 9 p to 6 a. Got it? Yes, sir. Okay, that's the best I can do. Miss Renata. Well, I agree. You talk too much. I think you broadcast when you should be listening. I, I do think that uh, your your the things that you told us, your plans about paying cash for everything, I think all that's unrealistic. Uh, and if you try, if that's your goal, then you're going to go back to the same reason that you can go back to the same things that got that brought you here. Um, 
you don't, you know, we hear what you're saying from all day long, every day, you know, but I'm going to go with Mr. Kelsey. I, I don't know. I, I hate to see you sit in jail for six months without any additional treatment. We don't have a mechanism to get that for you because I would vote to send you to a treatment program, but because they're not moving, uh, I believe you could get it on the street. Um, so my vote is the same as Mr. Kelsey's to grant with those conditions. Thank you. I don't want to see you again, Mr. LeBlanc. You won't. <laughs> okay. Ms. Jackson. Mr. LeBlanc, I can't go with my colleagues. I've seen too many people like you in my 28 years on the bench. You do a lot of talking, but that's all it is. You're in complete denial. You make excuses. Your daughter is in college, not because of anything you've done, but what she has done on her own with the assistance of her mom. She is not going to be kicked out of college. She can get a student loan. All of this is a bunch of talk, and it doesn't ring true to me. Uh, and the reason that you're not going to learn anything in the next six months is because you don't listen. It has nothing to do with programs. You've been through programs repeatedly. You have been given opportunities on supervision repeatedly, and you have failed miserably. You have four previous convictions for drug offenses, as well as an identity theft. I think you're trying to con us, but more importantly, I think you're conning yourself. You are not ready, and I am not prepared to vote to release you because I don't think you're ready. You get out of work release because you claim you want to do programs, and now you complain that you don't have programs or you want to go back to work release. If you were really where you needed to be, you wouldn't be so anxious to get out knowing that you only have a few more months. I've seen this over and over and over again. You are not ready and you're kidding yourself. And so today my vote would be to deny because of your poor supervision history and your proximity to your good time release date. Good luck to you. Thank you. All right, you have uh, two votes to grant and one to deny. Uh, we'll. we'll get this clarified, I believe with the mod moderate Tiger score, uh, it would be a denial. Is that correct, uh, staff? Yes, sir, that is correct. All right, two votes to grant, one vote, I mean, then one to deny, you have a moderate Tiger score, so your parole has been denied. Good luck to you. Try to take as many classes as you can while you're there. Good luck. We'll adjourn at 10 saw at 10 <clears throat> Wow. So that was another Miss Jackson mic drop. <laughs> she says, uh, she, you know, it's interesting. I'm, I'm a little torn by this one, not because I don't agree with what Miss Jackson said, but because what is the purpose really? You know, he, is it, is it simply on the principle that that she doesn't want the board to be duped, that she doesn't want him to feel that he's duping the board uh, because he is just going to sit there. He's not going to learn anything. He's not going to get anything out of it versus being released. He's going to have to do 90 uh, AA in 90 days. Then continue. You know, he's all the stipulations of being uh, from the parole board. And I, for those reasons, I would say, I, I would say to have, to have paroled him. I, you know, he must have been, seen, I bet you, I wouldn't be surprised if he was relieved that he got denied because once they start putting all those stipulations down, like, wow, that's intense. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. We have seen, uh, it's been a while since we've seen the 90 and 90 days, at least since, you know, uh, in the past few months of recording, um, and I, I've kind of always liked that because I felt that that was something that it's very clear, defined what you need to do, and 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 that someone could probably create certain habits, um, sponsorships, and maybe 
set themselves up to succeed. But Miss Jackson, just with the mic drop, uh, you know, your daughter's in college, not because of you. It's because of her, because of her mother, and she can get a student loan. And and you know, his plan about about paying for everything cash. I mean, I, I I've I've been there once in my life. I've I've been in debt several times. And I went down the whole Dave Ramsey thing, if any of you are familiar with him. And if you can do it, it's a good game plan. But to have that game plan coming out of prison, like they said, that's pretty difficult to do. And, you know, I enjoyed the uh, I actually did enjoy the, the Kelsey interview there. I thought it was one of the few times, not the few times, but it was I felt like he actually was, you know, had empathy for maybe because of what his father went through. And I thought it was kind of like a good conversation that he was having. Um, and he's trying to be real with him. And man, I, I, I just got back from the gym and showered. And the room that I am in is kind of like a, it's a makeshift garage. And um, it's, uh, I'm like starting to sweat for some reason. Anyways, um, I, I, uh, what would you have done? In, in one sense, again, I, I think Miss Jackson wanted to set the record straight, and I hear her, uh, you know, he, he left work release because, and that's a good point, you left work release because you wanted more programs, and now you want to go back to work release because there are no programs, and that's, that is kind of telling right there, right? But he is out, and he hasn't, we don't have any records of him returning, Hopefully he can stay out and we'll have to hear your thoughts on this. So let's move to the next hearing. It's classified as a first felony offender. Offenses, manslaughter, aggravated burglary. Sentencing date, January 27, 2010. Sentence to a total of 50 years. Parole date, August 1st, 2021. Good time, May 4th, 2039. Full term, September 4th, 2047. Is this information correct, sir? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Mr. Roche. Thank you, Ms. Teresa. Good morning, Mr. Watts. How are you? I'm doing all right. Good. My name is Alvin Roche. Your case has been assigned to me. And we're going to have a conversation after I enter some information into the record, okay? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, Mr. Watts, you're currently, what, 45 years old? Yes, sir. And uh, you've been incarcerated for 24 and a half years on a 50-year sentence. That's about right? Yes, sir. So you've served about 50% served about of your sentence. Your yes, first sir. felony offender, and I see where you've accumulated 330 days, good time. Tell me Mr. about- Mr. Roche, excuse, I'm sorry, to, I'm sorry to interrupt. We're gonna we're gonna put this on pause for a moment till we get Jane on the phone. Okay. Give us one minute. Good morning, Ms. Hogan. Would you introduce yourself for the record? Good morning. I apologize. I was having some connection issues this morning. Jane, Jane Hogan, on behalf of the Parole Project, uh, representing Mr. Watts, I will make a statement at the end uh, with the committee's approval. Thank you. Technology is wonderful if it worked all the time. 
<laughs> exactly. Thank you. Uh, now, Mr. Watts, we were, talking, we were talking about your program. And, and uh, Ms. Hogan, all we did was preliminaries. We've got to the point where we're discussing his 330 days of earned good time. So let's talk about programs. Mr. Watts? Yes, ma'am. I mean, yes, sir. Tell me about the programs you completed and what did you derive from those programs as far as your um, negative um, attributes that caused you to be incarcerated? Uh, so the classes I took, I took living in balance, thank you for a change, substance abuse. Um, um, right now I'm currently in uh, AANA. Um, I'm also, I took uh, parenting one and two, uh, anger management. Um, uh, as of right now, I'm in um uh, man, as of right now, um uh, hey, let me help you out. Tell yes, me, tell me what thinking for a change did for you as far as changing your mindset as far as crime is concerned. Well, thank you for a change, for example, showed me different um, different ways to, they, they actually it showed me different scenarios, you know what I'm saying, um, on how to handle it. Uh, like for instance, um, me and my boss or something will get into it or whatever. Um, it's three ways that I can uh, respond to this here. Uh, I can do it in a negative way, you know what I'm saying? Because my boss, he might come with a negative attitude today, and it's not it's not his fault that I'm supposed to perform a certain way. Um, my job is to. This is what thinking for a change do for me. It shows me the right way to do things. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, evidently. There was some drugs and alcohol uh, involved in your uh, life when you committed this crime. What did living in balance do for you? Sir, living in balance, well, actually, you know what I'm saying? It really, you know, showed me a better way of doing things as far as uh, on how to, uh, to fight that, you know what I'm saying? Knowing that addictions runs in through my family, you know, it taught me how to how to uh, do things a little better than uh, think, to think different uh, as far as my outlook on using drugs and alcohol. Okay. Now, since we're uh, talking about drugs and alcohol, at what age did you start using drugs? There are... Uh, when I was on the streets, I never, I never used drugs. Um, while in prison for a few years, I wound up doing drugs, and you know, I realized that it really wasn't for me. So, so, I, so yes, actually, you were introduced to illegal substance while you were incarcerated for the first time. Yes, sir. Okay, well, did you abuse alcohol before incarceration? No, sir. So tell the panel this morning exactly what happened that day. Just a brief overview of what happened that caused your incarceration. As far as I'm not really understanding the question. Tell me what happened that that caused you to be arrested, convicted, and incarcerated? Oh, well, 
So, uh, um, and the spirits come to my house. Um, told me we were walking somewhere, so we wound up walking to this house. And when we got to the house, a gun was brandished, and well, a woman come to the door. Okay, the gun was who had the gun? And the spears. Okay. And when the gun was brandished, uh, at that moment, I froze up. Uh, and the spears ran into the house. Within a few, within a few moments, um, I heard a gun go off, and so I took off running. And maybe a week later, I was charged with, I was charged with the crime. I was picked up on the charge. Okay. So, so, so you never entered the house? Yes, sir, I did enter the house. Okay. Took, uh, took a few Mr. Steps. Watt, I'm, get, I'm, I'm getting a feeling that you're not telling me everything that you know. Exactly why were you arrested and convicted of manslaughter. No, nah, that's because I was with a person that um, that committed the crime, that committed committed a murder, and I wouldn't. I look at myself as I'm not as uh, I'm just as guilty as he is. And why would you? Um... Uh, did you plead guilty to aggravated burglary? Yes, sir. Okay. And and why did you plead guilty to aggravated burglary? No, sir. I pleaded guilty um in 2010 aggravated um burglary because uh, I want to accept the responsibilities of what I done. Okay. What did you do? I entered the house. And your your co-defendant Anthony Spears uh, was billed with obstruction of justice, and he pled guilty and served four years. Yes, sir. Is that about right? Yes, sir. Why wasn't he charged with manslaughter? Uh, because, um, to be honest with you. Uh, and that's what I want today, honesty. Yes, sir. Uh, to be honest with you, uh, sir, uh, I was afraid of him. Uh, I made a few statements, um, and I wound up taking the charge. I wound up making a, a what are you saying? What, are you saying that you were intimidated by your co defendant? Yes, sir. Okay. Let's continue with the interview. Have you received any substance abuse treatment other than living in balance since you started using drugs while incarcerated? No. Um, actually, yes, I have. Um, like I said, right now, I'm in uh, AANA right now. I'm taking classes for that. Okay. And how how long was the duration of the drug use while incarcerated? I'm from uh, maybe two, three years tops. Okay. And at what at at what point it, after three years did you sat decide that drugs was not a uh, way that you will ever leave the institution. I realized I realized this here, you know, by my mother and how I grew up, by them being um, abusive to drugs and alcohol. I, I just 
I don't want to go down that road. I want to be better than that, so I, I just couldn't do it. And by me having a, a child myself, I don't want to put her through this here, through okay. the same thing that I was put through as a child. So, so basically, when you decided that, you sought help for your drug addiction. Yes, I did. Okay. Uh, let's talk about hours. You've also completed 100 hours pre-release, living in balance. You have a low risk assessment. You have 17 disciplinary write-ups and 24 years of incarceration. The last one was January 2020 for contraband. What was the contraband? Well, the contraband was of drugs. The contraband was of drugs. Uh, when, I, when, when the write-up happened, uh, I was on a legal call out and the dormitory was searched and the drugs were found in an unmarked laundry sack. And uh, I tried to, in the process of being rolled up for it, what I did was, um, I was, I told him that to check the camera. Um, and they refused. And they, and they refused. Mm -hmm. I also, uh, I filed up appeal, you know, but it was denied. Yes, yes. Now, today is a day of reckoning. Yes, Mr. Watts, yes, sir. Was, it, was the drugs in the laundry bag your drugs? Yes, sir, it wasn't my drugs. Okay, that's all, all I needed, yes or no. I wanted an honest answer. So it wasn't. Okay. And your last disciplinary write up before January 2020 was when? You remember? No, sir, I do not. Okay. Uh, we'll get to that later. Uh, tell me about any community service, organizational participation, or any special activity you did while you were incarcerated? Um, as far as, I mean, I, I really don't know where. Any community service, have you worked with hospice? Have you worked uh, 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 as uh, uh, inmates? Yes, sir, I have. Um, right now, at this matter of fact, right now at this moment, um, I'm a tier mentor. And mm -hmm. uh, I try to do um, everything I could to to uh, to help people that's help young men that don't understand, you know, what's going on with them. And I try to keep them out of trouble. Um, that's here at Hunts. I was a tear walker. I was a tear walker for uh, two and a half, maybe three years. Um, over there in D1 cell block at Hunts Correctional Facility. Um, so, uh, you know, again, I, 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 I have. Mr. Watch, you're not much of a talker, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull this information out of you. I Thank need you. this information on the record, okay? Uh, tell me about your job presently, what are you doing on a daily basis at uh, Allen Correctional Center? Yes, sir, uh, right now, uh, at the moment, I'm a, I'm a dorm orderly. Uh, I, I clean the dorm. And you're a mentor too, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Were you employed at the time of your incarceration? No, sir, I wasn't. Why, why, why not? Because at the time, um, the place where I was working at was going through a, a merger. Um, um, Air Chance Warehouse in Hammond, Louisiana, it was going through okay. a merger and I wound up getting laid off. Okay. Were you actively seeking employment? Yes, sir, I was. Okay. And as Dell Champ, the, the uh, grocery chain. Uh, yes, sir. Okay. 
Uh, have you acquired any vocational skills or training while you've been incarcerated? Well, sir, um, no, sir, as far as certificates go, no, I haven't, but at the same time, it's not too much that I haven't done. Um, I done been in welds and I done done welding. I done done pipe fitting. I have done leather work, woodcraft. Um, I did a lot of things, you know, because I know how to build with my hands, sir. Good. Um, are you a trustee? Yes, sir, I'm not. Um, uh, my charge and the time that I have uh, don't permit me to be a trustee. Okay. Okay. Tell me about your transition plan. I hear that you're going to the Louisiana Parole Project. Am I correct? Yes, sir. And then after your transition period, I understand that you have a daughter who's here with us, but and she's in California. Yes, sir. And you have a residency plan with your daughter in California. Yes, sir. Okay. What are you going to do for employment? Well, um, right now, um, I'm trying to get with the, like I say, the parole project to uh, to get me up to speed, to get me a job. And getting with my daughter is really, is eventually, that's what I'm trying to do. You know, eventually um, get wherever she at. Um, but for the time being, um, um, the parole project going to bring me up to speed. Um, for a job go and like I say, uh, um, that's, well, that's okay. I need to know about your employment in California. Is there any uh, effort to make connection with some kind of employment in the state of California? Well, sir, well, right now, no, sir. Well, if that's going to be your permanent residency. Yes, sir. Don't you think you need to put some feelers out? Yes, sir. You yes, have, have your daughter line up some employment? Uh, I believe she has, sir. Okay. And... And I'm going to ask, and after this, I will ask your daughter about that. But my plan is if this interview goes well, yes, sir, and everything is in line, to, to uh, only a transition period with the Louisiana State, Louisiana Parole Project. And after that transition period, I'm going to put a requirement that you pull out to California with your daughter. Mm -hmm. So finding employment yes, in your sir. permanent residency is very important to me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, Warren Cooley, would you like to add any information, comments, observations? No, sir. Uh, I think everything's been covered from, from our standpoint at the facility. Thank you, sir. Uh, let me speak with Ms. Uh, Watts. I'm yes, sir. Have you lined up any type of employment for your father? Yes, sir. I um, lined up several things for my father, including Alcomani. It's called Alcomani. They hire felons. They hire people that have been in, incarcerated over um, 10 years. Um, also, I lined up. He has another program that he can get into that I know someone of. It's called Desk Ready. It will help him. Um, it's an on-call position. But it's just for starters. Um, it's 15 months. It's just so he could get a little bit of work history. Um, and also, I didn't um, found the therapist also for my dad because I don't want him to, you know, come out of there and like, I don't want him to fall into like the wrong hands or doing the wrong things. Um, so I have like several things for him to do as far as 
um, if he wants to continue his education, jobs, therapy, um, emotional support, um, financial support, and everything, all of the above. Thank you. And uh, we will get back with you later to make your statement. Um, Mr. Mayor Bell. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I do have one or two questions uh, just to clear up a little bit about the facts in the case. Uh, Mr. Watts, uh, just, just so I'm clear and our record is clear, uh, yes, you pled guilty to aggravated burglary. Yes, you sir. knew that you had a gun or your co-defendant had a gun. Y'all went into the house to, to, to burglarize it, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, it's my understanding as well while Mr. Roche is absolutely correct that your client pled guilty to a much lesser, much lesser charge and got a much lesser sentence, you actually went to trial, was convicted of murder, and got the death penalty. Yes, and then your co-defendant confessed to a security guard that he was the one that did the shooting. Yes, you got a new trial or you got a new opportunity to plead that's when you pled guilty to the charge of manslaughter and aggravated burglary. Is that right? Yes, sir. And you don't deny any of those things. You don't deny any, you don't deny your role in, in this burglary that resulted in a killing. Yes, sir, I do not. And that's why you pled guilty to manslaughter and aggravated burglary. Yes, sir. Okay. That's, that, I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Marabella. I see no further questions from the panel. Ms. Teresa? We have Ms. Antoinette Lodge. Yes. We're ready for your statement, uh, Ms. Watts. OK. Um, hello, my name is Antoine Shawaz. I'm Antoine Watts' daughter. Um, I'm currently the age of 24. Um, I've been waiting for this day my whole life. Mind you, my father been locked up my whole life. Um, and it's it's been it's been very hard um, as things go, but I try to get through it. Also, my mother, she made sure that I knew who my father was. She made sure that I knew who he is as a person, not just what somebody has to say about him. Um, and also by my mother recently passing, um, I felt like this was only God had come with a great opportunity for my father to even be put up to be let out on parole. Um, and I relate my relationship with my father is outstanding to say that he's been locked up my whole life. Like, we didn't share so many things. Uh, we didn't. I was able to be in contact with him, and everything like everything and above. You know what a father can do. Uh, a father can do his best. And when I tell you, my father has done absolute best on supporting me emotionally. It feels like he's here physically um, by our relationship that we do have with each other. Um, and also, I can support my father, must support my father in many ways, um, how he support me. Uh, my father is the only person that I have. Um, so if you grant him this opportunity, he will not be getting in no trouble because I don't want to lose my father to the streets or anything on that note. So, yes, sir, that's it. Thank you, Ms. Watts. You're very courageous. And now uh, for 24, you're very mature. Thank you for your participation. Ms. Teresa? There are no further participants. Okay. Uh, Mr. Watts, would you make a brief closing statement before your attorney closes the hearing? Um, first of all, I would like to thank the board for giving me this opportunity. Um, secondly, um, I would like to apologize for everything that then happened up until this day. 
I would like to apologize to the family. Uh, and let them know that I'm truly sorry for what took place. Um, sir, uh, I have dreamed and prayed about this here my whole life. I just, I, I really want to be with my daughter. Um, she really all I have. Uh, that's it. Thank you, Mr. Watts. Ms. Hogan. Yes, sir, Mr. Roche, thank you. Um, just very briefly, if Antoine is granted, he will go to the parole product in Baton Rouge. We will immediately start the um, interstate parole agreement to California. If needed, we will also help identify um, reentry services and, and other uh, wraparound services in the, in the area of California that he's moving to with his daughter. Um, I've uh, gotten to know Antoine both through meeting with him these last weeks and also through speaking to his former lawyers who represented him at trial and at his plea. And everybody really says the same thing about how humble Antoine is, how, how um, kind he is. And it really shows through his work with other people, even when he was on death row for three years, he uh, wrote letters to people. He read an inordinate amount of books. Um, he's, he's never lost hope. He has dreams, he has aspirations. And I wrote a little bit in the brief about the life that he lived leading up to his incarceration. And he really has a story to tell. Uh, people relate to him. He's always sharing his testimony with other people and he will continue to do that if he is granted the opportunity for release. Um, he has a low risk assessment and the parole project is poised and ready to help him transition in any way that is needed. So we would ask that you grant um, Antoine release with any conditions that are deemed appropriate. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hogan. And I did read the early life of uh, Antoine and it was amazing that he has gotten to this part today. Um, is the panel ready to vote? Uh, Antoine, your case was assigned to me. And I'm going to vote first. I agree with Ms. Hogan that you're humble and you don't teach your home. And I think you've done a lot more while incarcerated than we discussed today but I had to pull most of that out of you. Um, I'm gonna grant your request today. But under some very, very tight restrictions. I'm gonna grant you release to the Louisiana Road Project. only for a transition period. Enough time for the paperwork to be done in a interstate co compact done to the state of California. It's usually approved because you have a blood relative who you'll be living with. So I don't think there'll be much trouble. But your release, your permanent release is attached to an approved interstate compact. If that compact is disapproved for any reason, you will be reincarcerated. I usually wait until the compact is approved but you'll be with the Louisiana Parole Project for that period and going through your transition. But for any reason that compact is not approved, you ought to be reincarcerated. 
Because I want you permanently with your daughter in California. Do you fully understand that? And Ms. Hogan is shaking her head and she understands exactly where I'm going, okay? After release, you'll have the curfew from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. You'll have to do community service with at-risk youth at least five hours a month. And you are to attend NAAA meetings at the discretion of your parole officer. Ms. Hogan, can you unmute your mic, please? Yes, sir. You've been working with Mr. Watts for, for a number of weeks and months. Yes, sir. You, you mentioned in your brief that you thought he might need a long-term substance abuse program before release. I was thinking about the Steve Hall program uh, to make sure that he has enough information and tools so that the habit that he picked up while incarcerated can be covered. If the board would be more inclined, it could maybe conditionally grant him to Steve Hoyle as long as he completes that. And, and we could then also, when he's at Steve Hoyle, we could start the interstate compact. Right. So it could be approved and maybe he could just go immediately yeah. from Steve Hoyle to California with maybe a brief um, interlude in in Baton Rouge with the parole project or whatever the committee deems appropriate. Sounds, sounds good. Okay. Okay. So let, let's start again, Mr. Watts. You, I'm granting your request upon completion of the Steve Hall Intensive Substance Abuse Program that will give you some extra ammunition in your fight against drugs and alcohol. And it does a lot of other things for you. After completing the Steve Hall Intensive Substance Abuse Program, you're to be released to the Louisiana Parole Project. After the transition period, you will go to California with an approved interstate compact. After release, Curfew from nine to six, community service with at-risk youth, five hours a month, and that should keep you busy. Mr. Marabella. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Roche, you did an excellent job in interviewing uh, Mr. Watts. Uh, I agree with all of your uh, assessment. Uh, I believe that, uh, especially since Ms. Hogan even suggested it, that uh, Steve Hoyle is an excellent uh, opportunity for him, uh, which will give him uh, certainly some extra ammunition to make sure that he will uh, stay out. Uh, so my vote would be the same to grant conditionally upon completing the Steve Hall program and then a, uh, a transition period with Louisiana Pro Project assuming that he can get uh, the interstate compact uh, transfer to California. So that would be my vote. Same conditions, same reasons, Ms. Rocha. Hey, thank you, Mr. Mary Bell. Mrs. Watts. <clears throat> thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Watts, uh, I concur with my colleagues. Uh, my vote is the same for the same reasons. I just want to tell your daughter, good job. You've done a really good job in, uh, in, the, in the young lady that she has become. And I encourage her to uh, do some reading on, on, on what's going on with a person that's been out, been in jail for over 20 years so that you can be aware of what living with him is gonna be like for you. Best wishes to you, young lady. And to you too, Mr. Watts. All right, thank you very much. 
Mr. Wise here received three votes to grant your early release upon completion of the Steve Hall program and then the Louisiana Pro Project transition period and an approved interstate compact to the state of California. Good luck, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. We'll go back and wait. Okay, so don't have I don't have good news to share to share on this. It took about a year till after he he got released, where he um, was in a fatal car crash, uh, October twelfth, twenty twenty three. So at the time of this recording, just two months ago. Um, so shortly after 10.30 p.m. on October 11, 2023, Louisiana State Police Troop notifi was notified of a two-vehicle crash on Louisiana 105 Highway. The preliminary investigations reveals that Watts was driving a 2018 Ford Fusion South. Um, at the same time, there was a 2009 Volvo 18-wheeler that was driving north. There's a LO, LA 105 in a right curve. For reasons still under investigation, Watts Ford crossed the center line into the path of the Volvo semi-tractor. Upon doing so, the vehicle struck the northbound lane of travel, causing the Ford to become fully engulfed in flames. Watts suffered fatal injuries and was pronounced dead at the scene. The driver of the 18-wheeler was wearing a seatbelt. He wasn't hurt. Um, Impairment on the part of Watts is unknown at this time. Toxicology tests they say are still pending. I, I you know, Richard uh, shared this information. I did one extra Google check to double check, but I don't see any other reports indicating anything on this case. Um, so as far as we know, he was completely, completely sober. The driver of the 18 wheeler submitted a breath sample showing that he was also, uh, that he had no impairment um it feels it feels tragic to me I, I in the sense that uh you know this this case is quite interesting interesting because he was initially uh found guilty of the homicide which was a such a horrible crime and we'll go over those court reports soon that he was given the death penalty he sat on death row for two years before his co-defendant uh, made that confession to the correctional officer. And then he was, uh, well, we'll go over the details, but he was, of course, taken off the death row and then given. So, you know, if you believe his story, imagine going from death row to freedom and then very quickly ending up in this in this accident which again we don't know what it was that caused it now he has an obituary which which um actually shared quite a bit of information that we didn't know um from the parole hearing and we can go over it. So he was a kind, loving family man, he never met a stranger. He was a hard worker and excellent person. He loved his two dogs, Dream and Templeton, which were his children. Um, he loved the saints and was a who dat fan for life. Um, he was employed at design precast on the time of his, of his death. He leaves the cherish uh, his memory of his wife, Stacy, and his two daughters, which, you know, again, we assumed he had just one daughter, but his two daughters, his two sons, and a grandson. Also his brothers, and, his, and it goes through the list. Um, and then there's something else that Richard found, which, you know, might they, but uh, someone had set up, maybe it was his daughter had set up a, no, I think it was his friend, um, had set up a, a fundraiser for him, which it almost had raised the goal of 2000, which is, which is impressive, 33 donations, right? People cared. 
And this was set up right before his accident. And, um, you know, just nine months ago. So just over a year, my dear friend uh, came home from 25 years of incarceration after spending three years on death row, three years on death row at Angola and the remaining 22 years in various facilities. He was arrested um, when he was just 21 years old, one month before his daughter was born. While he was incarcerated, he accomplished a lot. He learned uh, a welding certificate focused on his faith and as a mentor of young men in the beginning years of his sentence. Um, when I picked him up from Allen Correctionals, his first two requests were one, to hit the gas pedal and two to for a cheeseburger. I love that. The photo um, above was taken five, was taken at five guys about two hours into his freedom while he waited for his cheeseburger. Wow. Since he came home, he's been settling into a world that is much different than the one he left. He held a steady job uh, working on generators for almost a year, but was unfortunately laid off a few weeks ago. Since then, he's been struggling to cover his day-to-day -day costs while searching for his next opportunity. If you have the means, please consider helping him navigate this. So, you know, it's it's when you lock someone up for 25 years and then you get out, even with the support of the parole project, even with family support, even with it seeing people who really cared about him, it's, it's just, I've seen documentaries on this. I mean, how can one expect to really just, just go with it, right? Um, now here's the, it, it's a long document. It's 21 pages and 21 pages of not just noise. It's, it's quite a lot in here. So I need to figure out, but, um, they want to determine the issue of the appeal of capital murder case and whether the trial court erred in denying the defense motion for a new trial based on newly discovered evidence, finding the matter warrant such relief. We reserve and remand for a new trial. So this is the appeal where he said he wanted a new trial after having given a death sentence and he did they gave it to him on september 3rd 1997 defendant was arrested on um for the august 29th 1997 murder of cecilia colonna a 75 year old resident a grand jury indicted the defendant for first degree murder on the basis that the killing was committed during the course of an aggravated burglary or during the course of an armed robbery and that the victim was over the age of 65. On October 8, 1997, the defendant pled not guilty. The matter went to trial two years later. After trial by jury, the defendant was found guilty and is charged. On September 23, 1999, the death penalty was imposed. And on January 13th, the defendant was sentenced to death. Facts and procedural history. So on August 29, 1997, approximately noon, Naclona arrived home to find the bottom half of the glass door to his house was removed. The wooden door, which his wife usually left open behind the glass, was closed. Clona looked through the small window in the wooden door and noticed that his wife's rocking chair had been tipped over. He entered the house of his wife's um, and found his wife's slippers strewn about on the sofa and it looked as if it had been kicked. He called out his wife's name but received no response. Clona grabbed the phone and called uh, his office as it was the first phone number that came to mind. He told the person who answered to call the police, which she did. He also notified Kelowna's son, Emily, in less than 10 minutes. Emily arrived at the parents' house or, um, and began looking around and entered the master bedroom where they found the deceased victim, Celine, Cecilia Colonna. Officer... Mark arrived at the scene next and kept a log of all the persons entering and exiting the, the, the crime scene. He turned the case over to the detectives uh, when they arrived shortly after him. Jim Churchman of the Louisiana State Police uh, Laboratory examined the scene for physical evidence and he found a spent cartridge near the victim's body and a bullet lodged in the bedroom wall. He collected gunpowder residue from the victim's face and examined the bullet that had killed the victim, which he later determined to be a 9 millimeter bullet. Churchman uh, reasoned that the abrasion ring on the victim's face indicated that the perpetrator shot the victim by placing the gun to her forehead and firing. So now you know why he got the death penalty a 75 year old victim to put the gun to head and pull the trigger. There's absolutely, of course, zero reason to do it unless you're just evil. And it's just, it's just insane. Although, although church, does that mean the man who confessed and got the short sentence got, so, so got, just got away with it. Is that what it, that means? 
I don't think he was retried, right? Although Churchman found very little ransacking, the victim's purse and its contents had been rifled. Uh, a set of car keys was in the victim's hand. Churchman photographed a shoe print, which he found on the kitchen floor. During the course of the investigation, Detective Pelvey delivered the pictures of the shoe print um, and went to a local sporting goods store and determined that the footprint in the victim's kitchen was from a Nike Air Max tailwind to shoe. On September 4, 1997, the detective preview received a tip from the, uh, uh, that the defendant and Anthony Spears were involved in the killing. The defendant had been taken into police custody the previous day on an unrelated burglary charge after the tip. Police also arrested Spears as a suspect of criminal murder. In the early morning hours of September 5, 1997, the defendant gave a statement. He told police that on the morning of the killing, Spears arrived at his house and the two of them entered the Cologne residence together. The defendant stated that Spears pulled out a gun and the two of them entered the residence. The defendant went into the kitchen while Spears went into the direction farther into the house. The victim surprised the defendant and the defendant told Spears that he wanted to leave. Spears wanted to stay and forced the woman to take them to a bank. While the defendant waited at the back door, he heard a commotion in the bedroom and then a gunshot. The defendants ran from the residence. Subsequently, defendant gave another recorded statement to the police in which he mentioned um, only his participation, which he mentioned only his participation in the killing. He again claimed that the victim surprised him. However, this time he stated that while he was telling her to move, the gun just went off. Defendant further stated that he did not know how the victim got to the floor. I mean, remember he, what he said. He said that he confessed to it because he was afraid of his co-defendant, which is which is an excuse we hear all too often in true crime right and it's the most ridiculous in my opinion excuse it's like really you're so afraid of him you'd rather get the death penalty than just say what happened you're not a kid you're 21 years old you're not like but it might actually have been true in this case i mean according to the jury they said it was but i don't know let's see what they can uncover Detective Glenn, who was also working on the case, claimed the defendant made a similar statement to him while the two were alone in a police car. Police have already determined that Nike Air Max shoes matching the print found in the victim's kitchen had been stolen in a recent burglary or of a store. The defendant had stolen the murder weapon um, a few days before the killing. Police obtained the murder weapon from Chucky Gibson, who had bought it from Anthony Spears after the grand jury indictment of the first degree. Of Cecilia. A defendant filed a various uh, pretrial motions, including a motion to suppress on November 10, 1998. The district court held a suppression hearing and a hearing to determine the admissibility of other crimes. Although the court found the restrictive conditions of the defendant's confinement bothersome, the court ruled the statement admissible, finding that they were given freely and voluntarily. The court also found admissible evidence of the two defendants' um, unadjudicated burglaries. There was one in which the he took the wep, the murder weapon and the one he took the the Nike Air Max shoes. On August 18, 1999, the, the defendant attempted to plead guilty to non-capital first degree murder. However, during the guilty plea, call a cool, oh, I don't know this word. Call why? Counsel informed the district court that despite his best effort to convict. To convince defendant to plead defendant had reservations and wished to stand trial. Interesting. On September 14, 1999, trial began. At trial, the state introduced evidence mentioned above. Crucial to the state's case was the testimony of Anthony Spears, who admitted that he was originally a suspect in the murder investigation and that he was testifying pursuant to a plea agreement. <laughs> Denying that he had ever been in the Kelowna residence, Spears claimed the defendant confessed to him that he killed the victim. Wow. So he's denying that he was even there. However, Spears admitted to the participant in a burglary with the defendant, the one of the store where he and the defendant each uh, procured a pair of Nike Air Max shoes. Spears stated he pled guilty to simple burglary for the incident as well as obstruction of justice and possession of Pepsi Cola, and that the district court sentenced him to terms totaling four years in prison, hard labor. Yeah, so what we are meant to believe, in my understanding, is that this guy shot this 75-year-old woman execution style 
in the head and and got away with a four year sentence. Wow. I mean, that's what we're meant to believe, right? Do you believe it? I, I guess in reality, we have no idea, right? While testifying at defendant's trial, Spears repeatedly stated that he was telling the truth as it was a requirement of his plea bargain. I mean, he did get up at his parole hearing when he had nothing to gain and stated it. The only thing that I was thinking was, well, maybe he had been telling his daughter all these years this story, and now he felt he was in a corner, and he just didn't want to admit it. I mean, imagine moving in with you. Imagine that moving in with your daughter imagine your daughter having you move in to your home i mean as much as everyone loves their dad to take in your father after he spent 25 years in prison it just doesn't seem like a winning formula but it also doesn't seem like that ever happens like he ever got the compact right because he never made it there but it also could be that the parole project was keeping him around if he, he needed more time i don't know but um Still, if he even if he he could always have told his daughter, hey, for my parole hearing, the parole project tells me I got to just say I was guilty. So don't don't worry about it. Right. But no, he still got up and said he wasn't for the defense. Charles Bruce Shaney testified that Spears and not the defendant had confessed to him further. The defendant testified consistently with his first tape statement, specifically that he got no further than the victim's kitchen when he heard Spears fire a shot. He further stated that he that he was coerced into the second recorded statement and that he never he was never alone with Detective Hawk. Defendant's wife testified that she was in the police car with the defendant and Hawk at the time. According to Hawk, the defendant confessed. The jury evidently found the defendant's version of events unconvincing as it found him guilty of first degree murder. Apparently, Spears had not been sentenced prior to the defendant's trial because the prosecutor stated in closing argument that the plea bargain could be rescinded if Spears did not tell the truth. See discussion. At the time of the defendant's trial, Spears was incarcerated, but he testified he was due to be released immediately following the trial. What a sham. Can you imagine someone? I mean, it is a pretty broken system when you have two people committing a murder. One testifies against his co-defendant and gets four years, and the other gets the death penalty. That doesn't make any sense. After the penalty phase of the trial, the jury determined the defendant should be sentenced to death. Four years. Uh, the motion for the new trial we now consider was filed with the defendant obtaining information about new evidence. Post-trial, during heated exchange, Spears stated to Steve Jackson, a security guard at an apartment complex, that he had killed an old white lady. Who would ever, why would you ever say that? <laughs> Post trial during a heated exchange. Okay. Spears stated Steve Jackson, a security guard at a car company. A few days later, Spears met with Jackson and apologized for the exchange. When Jackson, a former sheriff's deputy, warned Spears about admitting that he had killed someone, Spears brushed off such warning, saying that he was not worried because he had already served time on charges related to the murder, and thus his view, double jeopardy, barred his prosecution. Defendant's motion for a new trial based on newly discovered evidence was summarily denied by the trial court. This court eventually remanded the matter for a hearing. At April 18, 2001, the state argued that Spears' statements was made during a heated argument. The state did not explain why Spears refused to recant when he met with Jackson a few days later. It, you know, the state hates, hates, hates being wrong. So they, we all, we see that all the time. They don't care. They like to keep people locked up, even if, like, all the evidence says they're innocent. And this is just a confession, right? The, dis the district court... Again, denied the motion without reasons pursuant to an order by the court. The district court then filed written reasons for the denial. On November 27, 2002, the court listed what is labeled as finding a fact. What I really want to find out is if Spears gets another sentence or if double jeopardy is in effect. Or if he's found to have lied that 
it would negate his his deal. Jackson was a neutral, independent, and unbiased witness. We had no apparent motivation to lie. That's the guard, right? Two, the event occurred after the trial, and truly, first, this legal description, newly discovered evidence. If I were sitting on a 13th juror on this case, I would believe that the statement was made. The statement would not have persuaded me to change my vote of guilty or my vote for death because it was merely the brash statement of a common street criminal who wished to elevate his reputation for violence in order to create more intimidation. This is especially true since he was obviously under influence of drugs or alcohol at the time and the last statement was made. Well, if you're not going to believe him when he says he did it, then why are you going to believe him when he says he didn't do it and his co-defendant did it? So in my opinion, that statement's ridiculous. Five, the evidence of the guilt of Watts was overwhelming at the trial, and no reasonable juror would say he swayed it by new evidence, especially since the testimony. How is it more evident? How is it? How? How is it any more obvious that he did it versus co-defendant? I don't understand that. Defendant's first motion in the trial concerned alleged communication between the alternate juror and the 12 members of the juror uh, and the guilty phase verdict in light of this position of the case. It's unnecessary to address. Okay. Um, in full consideration by the jury, personally, I do not doubt that the statement of Shaney was in fact made, but simply rejected by the jury as street talk bravado, similar to the statement made by Jackson after the trial. Number six, Watts confessed to the crime in great detail on several occasions under circumstances which was voluntary and unsolicited. There was no evidence that any of the statements were coerced in any fashion or non-voluntary. After the denial of his motion for new trial, defendant pursuant insistent on an appeal. How do you feel about this? Do you feel that? Man. I don't know. I'm more just disgusted how one man can possibly get four years and the other the death penalty, you know? New material evidence that notwithstanding their exercise of reasonable diligence, the defendant was not discovered before during the trial available if evidence. And da, da, da. So how do they decide this? Um... They're going over. These concepts concerning the scope of the trial's duty towards motion and trial based on newly discovered evidence have withstood the test of time, having been stated almost verbatim in the United States Supreme Court. Um, victims killer, thus the state's sole contention is that the new evidence would not lead a new jury to reach a different conclusion. At the hearing on the defendant's motion for new trial, Jackson explained that his brother and Spears' mother had dated for several years, causing Jackson to consider himself like an uncle to Spears. Jackson, a former sheriff deputy, testified that during the late summer of early fall 2000, while working as a security guard at an apartment complex, he received word that Anthony Spears was involved in a heated argument with three people. Jackson told those arguing to leave the premises, and all but Spears complied. When Spears attempted to enter the apartment building, Jackson stopped him, and he began to curse. Jackson warned Spears that he would call the police, and Spears threatened to beat Jackson. Jackson told Spears not to go that route with him, but Spears lunged at Jackson nonetheless. Jackson hit Spears as he lunged and knocked him down. Spears then got up and said that he was going to get his gun and when I come back, I will kill you like I killed the old white lady. Jackson then called police who were unable to apprehend Spears. A few days later, Spears returned to the apartment complex and apologized to Jackson. Jackson brought up Spears' statement regarding killing, warning, and about admitting to such matters. Nevertheless, Spears told Jackson he was not worried because he had already served time on charges related to the murder. Thus, in his views, double jeopardy barred his prosecution. Jackson further testified that on the night of the confrontation, Spears was acting way out there, and that he probably would have made good on his threat to return with his gun had the police not arrived. On cross-examination, Jackson added that Spears had threatened to kill him the night before the confrontation described above, but admitted that Spears had not acted on his earlier threat. 
imagine if that's a flex in your mind if that's bragging i'm gonna kill you like i killed a 75 year old woman like wow you're so tough bro i mean like really that's your flex wow the trial court found Jackson remarkable, remarkably credible due in part, no doubt, to the fact that Jackson was a former deputy sheriff who considered himself like an uncle to Spears. So, yeah, I mean, he's a former deputy sheriff and he's considers himself an uncle to the man who he's telling the police. That does make him credible, in my opinion. The trial judge believed that Spears told Jackson he, Spears, would kill Jackson if I killed the old white like okay thus although the trial judge believed jackson the trial judge did not believe that jackson was told the truth so they believe jackson but they just don't believe he told the truth the trial judge found so they they believe they told the truth when he testified he they don't believe it they believe he told whatever they get to pick and choose what they believe um when ruling in article 8513 motion trial judge duty is not to weigh the new evidence although he uh, although he were a jury decided guilt or innocence and determine what the true false light of this information. In other words, the trial judge is not assessed newly discovered evidence. Although he were, if he were a 13th juror, the trial judge should not weigh new evidence as if he or she was a jury deciding guilty or innocence, or in this case, whether or not to impose a death penalty, but should ascertain whether there is new material fit for a new jury's judgment. The only issue is whether the result probably would be different. And if you would say that it would not be different, if a jury did not hear this testimony, if it would not be different, then you're in denial because there's, in my opinion, no way a jury would not look at that as at the very least reasonable doubt. And, and how could any commons, how could any jury say, wait a minute, there's two people in a room. One's, one of them shot her. One of them is going to get four years, and one of them is going to get the death penalty. Hmm. Oh, and one of them admitted to it outside after they got the deal that they did it. You're telling me that's not? Yeah, okay. Contrary to these principles, the trial judge insists in the case stated specifically that he's evaluating new evidence of the 13th juror. Thus, the trial judge fell into legal error. So he's not allowed to. Hold on. Um, so he's not allowed to do that. Reviewing the new evidence by the proper standard, this court concludes that the evidence probably would have led a new jury to a different result, at least in the penalty phase of the proceeding. I would say both, but yes, at least. In support of this position, the state argues that Spears made the admission in question during the course of heat argument to make himself seem even badder, and that the statement does not call into question defendant's guilt. The state further claims that the statement by Anthony Spears amounts to nothing more than bragging. How is that a flex, though? Come on, it's not bragging. Oh, my gosh. Had Spears only made inculpatory remarks during the course of his heated encounter with Jackson, such arguments would be persuasive. However, as mentioned above, Jackson testified that even one temper had cooled days after the confrontation. Spears did not deny killing the victim. Instead, Spears expressed his belief that he could not be prosecuted for his action. That's a great point. Accordingly, the circumstances do not support state's contention or the trial court factual finding the Spears statements was more uh, braggad... Bragged I know what this word is. Braggad... Braggadocio? No, it's it's braggadocio. Braggadocio. I, it's funny because I know the word, but now when I need to read it. Further evidence supports the defendant's contention that Spears' confession would have influenced the verdict at the trial of the state based on significant portion of the case. Spears' testimony. Spears testified on the night of the murder. Um... Defendant came to me. He told me that he needed to talk. I stepped outside. He told me that he shot a lady, an old lady, and he told me that he didn't, that he went to this house, demanded money, and the lady said she didn't have no money. So he tried to take her to the bank, and she said she didn't know her bank number card. So I took her into room, put her on her knees, and shot her. So this is what Spear said that the defendant 
This is what he testified. Spears also testified that initially the defendant only admitted that he shot the victim because she had surprised him. He explained the defendant told him that he shot the victim because she had no money. Spears then testified that the defendant gave him the murder weapon, which he sold to Chucky Gibson on cross-examination. Spears claimed that before trial, he and the district attorney had talked about just me coming and telling the truth. And he was telling me if I lie that the deal is off. Spears then said that he had never been to the victim's house. Spears concluded his testimony by repeating that he was telling the truth while reminding the jury that if he did not tell the truth, he would go to trial on the charges to which he had pled guilty. All right. So his testimony was he was never even at the house. So as far as the jury was concerned, um, only one person was at the house. Okay. And he's getting four years just for the robbery. Now I get it. Right, right, right. Okay, so that's how the jury felt about it. During closing arguments, the state placed great weight on Spears' testimony, stating, you know what else my daddy told me? An honest man cannot tell a lie. Now a liar, every now and then, will tell the truth. I'm not asking you to believe him. I'm asking you to consider whether or not you believe him. That's your job. You listen to his testimony, and you decide if Anthony Spears is telling the truth. I'll tell you this. I made a deal with him, made him sign this form. I made him discuss with his lawyer. And if he doesn't abide by the form, I can revoke his deal. And you know, what's the first thing I told him? He's got to do his deal. Remember, this is the, the DA or the, the, you know, telling this to the jury. Answer any questions put forth to you by law enforcement officer, not abuse his case, not anything, anything at all. He has to tell the truth, period. If he doesn't tell the truth, no deal. That's all I told him. That's all I want. And when you unpack that, it's like, um, okay, so he signed a paper to get four years instead of the death penalty. And the threat is what? <laughs> if, he, if he lies, then no deal. But what do you mean? If he tells the truth, there's no deal. Then he gets the death. But like, it's such a dumb statement, but said in a very, you know, DA way to a jury, and it's I'm sure it sounded movie-esque. The state also sought to discredit the testimony of Charles B. Shaney. Shaney testified that on the night of the murder, he and Spears had attended a wedding reception. At the reception, Spears pulled his friend Shaney aside and admitted to him through tears that he had shot the old lady. Specifically, Spears stated that he told her to get on her knees and look at him and shot her in the face. Get on her knees and look at me. So here's a case where they have testimony from a friend who Spears confessed again, and they disregarded that. Oh, they just, dis yeah, they said, the prosecutor said this credit Shaney's claim during the closing argument stating, Charles Shaney, Charles Buch, convicted murderer, murderer. I, I didn't call Charles Shaney, wouldn't call him. He's trash, don't trust him, don't like him. Would believe a word he said. He's a convicted murderer, but you heard him and you're going to have to make a decision wow they actually had in this case someone claim that he bragged so he bragged to killinger at least to two different people that we know of and i would totally uh, my argument would be um he has everything to lose by testifying <laughs> he, you know it's like being called a snitch wow spears confession to jackson cast doubt on the above quoted testimony and arguments submitted by the state that this person Spears confessed to after the trial, Jackson had no particular interest in this case. Exactly. Unlike Shaney, Jackson was neither a convicted felon nor someone who had a possible grudge against Spears. Instead, he was a former police officer. Likewise, Spears' admission bolstered the fact that cooperated defendants first recorded. This is just great. You know, in my opinion, uh, looking at this, I, I do think you couldn't have convicted him. It's just they had literally one person's testimony who had every reason to testify and that and and, and he had no credibility and a four-year deal likewise physical evidence supports an inference in spears and not the defendant actually killed the victim the shoe print was found in the kitchen not the bedroom thus 
If one concludes that the print was the defendant's, his original recorded statement to police that he stayed in the kitchen is corroborated. Wow. Whew. Further, although the defendant admitted to taking the murder weapon days before the shooting, he, he testifies that he told they sold it to Spears before the day of the murder. Police obtained the murder weapon from a third party who brought the gun from Spears after the shooting. The gun was bought from Spears, not the defendant. Are you kidding me? Because Spears' statements that he committed the murder is corroborated by the physical evidence related to the case, Shaney's testimony, and by the defendant's first testimony is also admissible under that article of statement uh, tending to expose the declarant's criminal, criminality, liability, and culprit. According to Spears' admission to Jackson that he killed the old white lady, his failure to deviate the front uh, another jury probable has reached a different result, especially in the penalty phase of the trial. Okay. Let's just, I got a conclusion. Appeal of the incident case present this court with one uh, meritorious argument at trial. The state based significant portion of this case on the testimony of Anthony Spears, the truthfulness of which uh, had been made questionable by Spears' later actions. After trial, Spears' initial suspect stated that Jackson, a former deputy sheriff, that he, Spears, had killed the victim. When given the chance to recant, Spears did not, stating that he was protected by double jeopardy, bar to prosecution. Spears' admission is bolstered by the fact that he sold murder weapons soon after the killing that the admission is consistent with the defendant's first recorded statement to the police and that Spears had knowledge of the details of the killing that the defendant denied having when he was given a second statement to police. Accordingly, Spears' admission to Jackson that he killed the old white lady and his failure to deviate from the admission when confronted indicate that another jury presented with all the evidence probably have reached a different result in the guilt penalty phase of the trial. It is appropriate to be skeptical that newly discovered evidence is offered at the trial. Such evidence must be thoroughly and cautiously scrutinized. The finality of the judgment is an important judicial and societal goal. Those who have been victimized and the families of those who have been victimized desire closure, especially a brutal and senseless crime against an innocent victim. However, this newly discovered evidence puts at issue a degree of culpability and whether the death penalty is appropriate based on the newly discovered evidence. The determination must be made on an evaluation of all the evidence the jury conviction and sentence vacated case remanded for new trial. There you have it. In my opinion, from reading this, uh, he did not do it. Yes, he was involved in it and should have gotten a sentence, but um, the other man, in my opinion, got away with, with, with murder. Um, and I don't know if that makes this even more tragic when you hear about him finally getting out of prison and then getting in this terrible accident. And we've been here a long time on this hearing, and I appreciate all who are still here. Um, it's always a question for me, do, do, do we do a hearing that is um, ends up having a large portion of it with the, with the follow-up, the unpacking and the research. So please let me know in the comment section if this is something that is interesting to you or not. But in my opinion, again, this, this is important to cover because, I mean, it, we'll never know, but it seems pretty clear that someone was uh, prosecuted, found guilty and sentenced to death for, um, but then you might say the system in a way worked because he was he uh, got a new trial and then and then served just 24, not just, but served 24 and a half years and was given parole. Which he which in this day and age, when you go into an armed robbery, capital robbery and, and someone is killed, you, you both are sentenced the same way. Both of them, he would have gotten a life sentence anyways, probably. Um, but. You let me know with that.